you. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. This is Jen Kovic Bordnick from Washington, D.C. at EHI Executives for Health Innovation. We're so delighted you're joining us here today. Welcome. Um, tell us where you are logging in from, where around the country. Show us in the chat room. Uh, we'd like to know where our folks are. Viet, I see you are with us. Can you hear us okay, Viet? Welcome Ontario, Canada. Welcome Massachusetts, Salem. Oh my gosh, Hawaii. Welcome. It's great to have Hawaii here. Gosh, that just makes you feel good just thinking about Hawaii, right, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Ruby, where are you dialing in from today? Why don't you let folks know? Hi, I just typed it in. Um, Florida, sunny oh. Florida. Okay, great. And we've got um, Mir here from Miami. So welcome, Austin, Texas, Arlington. Great to see you guys. Montana, wonderful to have you, Julie. Welcome. It's great to have you here today. Rabina, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. Okay, my New Jersey contingency is here. I was in Jersey all weekend when 1A was as well, so. Uh, my old stomping grounds in Columbus, Ohio. Perfect, great. Seattle, Minnesota. Um, if there's no sound, you um, need to turn your volume up because there is sound. <laughs> um, hey, Jen, he, yeah. John Halak has joined. All right, John, welcome. We're just getting started here. Hooray. John, why don't you tell folks where you're logging in from? Uh, I am in Rochester, Minnesota. And uh, of course, Mayo has a global presence. And though I live in Boston, you'll find me in Minnesota, in Florida, and Arizona. In fact, I've been in like seven states in the last nine days. Okay, well, if you've got Massachusetts here. Um, we've got the Minnesota contingency here. <laughs> uh, Florida's here, so hopefully uh, we've got everybody. Atlanta, welcome. We don't want to leave you guys out. It's great to have everybody here today. All right, so I've got a couple of quick slides I'm going to run through, and then we're going to just jump in because, as you can see, we have an incredible group today. We just switch the next slide for me real quick. Emma, so um, I am so excited to be talking about interoperability and fire with this stellar crew. Um, John Halamka, president of Mayo Clinical Platform. Wonderful to have you here today. Um, Viet Nguyen, who is a new, new title, um, Chief Standards Implementation Officer at HL7 International. Viet's having been having a little bit of trouble with his camera, but he is here. So um, Viet, <laughs> Viet says, um, John Halamka is the Johnny Cash of healthcare IT. So <laughs> you have been everywhere. So welcome Viet, we love to have your humor and it is very welcome here. Dr. Mark Overhage, one of my favorite um, friends and fans of EHI, um, Chief Medical Informatics Officer now at Anthem. Welcome Mark, great to have hey, you. Everybody. <laughs> and um, one of my favorite women, Ruby Rayleigh, who is the VP of Healthcare at Axway. Ruby has been with us. We've been talking fire for a while now. So um, this is going to be a super conversation. So happy to have everybody here today. Thank you. Um, and we're going to keep it as active as possible. We want to get as many questions as we can in. I've got a slew of questions that were submitted online. Um, put them in the chat box if you have more questions. We're gonna just do a kind of a speed round here later on to get through it. So welcome everybody. Um, two quick announcements before we jump in. Um, real quick, we have a huge release coming out on Thursday with a big announcement. Um, EHI and CDT, we're actually releasing the final framework and the final standards on consumer privacy for health data. Um, and a big announcement, um, we're going to be talking about who's actually going to be taking over that accountability and self-regulatory model on Thursday. So join us. You do not want to miss this. This is going to be great. And um, RWJF has been fantastic. Um, next week, we've got another conversation on um, fire. It's definitely coming up again next week um, with one of your favorite folks, guys. Uh, John Glasser is going to be with us, uh, Dr. Laura Kropa with the um, VA, and we've got Craig Lamoli. So join us next Tuesday for another fun-filled conversation. 
And a big thank you, Ruby. Thank you, Axway. Thanks for um, supporting this program today. We are a very, very small nonprofit in Washington, D.C., and we can't do any educational programs without the gracious and generous support of companies like Axway. So thank you for letting us um, broadcast this conversation today. We, we really appreciate it. And we're going to actually just jump right in, guys. So Emma, let's ditch the slides <laughs> and get to the fun part of the conversation today. Um, one thing I want to just start with, just to set level set a little bit, and Ruby, I'm going to let you do this first question here, is can we just simply explain to folks um, the value of fire? Because before, I don't want to get too technical today, um, but it'd be great to give folks a couple of examples about what are they going to be actually able to do with fire once we have this implemented and, and tell folks what can they not do now that they're going to be able to do. Okay, I'll give it a shot. So simply the goal of this and several other bits of key legislation and regulation is about giving consumers more power of choice and helping us all improve outcomes. And the personal example is a couple years ago, my husband had a slip disc we thought in his back. So we got several referrals, we're talking to a specialist, um, but we did not know what it was gonna cost. And we were trying to sort that out in advance. Um, and so I asked the, or so I go in with my husband, I talk to the orthopedic surgeon. He says, I have no idea, but I'll give you the DSG codes because I know you're in healthcare. And I said, great. So I took those and I started calling the hospital and I could not find a single number at the hospital that knew how to give me a quote. And so then the, I called back to the doctor's office. They said, we'll talk to your health plan. So I called the health plan and they said, oh, we have no idea what the hospital is going to charge on the day of the surgery, but we can tell you what your out-of-pockets and your deductibles are for this with the DSG codes. So you're just going to have to go on faith. So my husband and I talked about it and we went on faith. Um, and in the future, I would be able to get his records, have them portable, be able to take them to another specialist for a consult or, a, or just to change doctors or health programs. Uh, health plans, and I would also be able to find out what is going to cost in advance. And we know that healthcare costs are a huge issue on consumers, but we also know that all of our clinicians want to do a better job. And we know that our health plans are trying to take care of our members and their costs. So I think it lifts all boats. That's a great example. So really just being able to move the information from the health plan to the provider, the clinician and the patient, and send that type of information back and forth in kind of a helpful way. That's a really um, great example. And I think everybody would love to be able to get, you know, more specific cost information. Um, thanks. I'm going to move over to um, the Johnny Cash of healthcare IT, <laughs> um, Dr. Halamka. John, if I may. Um, we keep hearing how this is going to transform healthcare. Um, fire is going to transform healthcare. This is going to be a you know big game changer. And just give me your honest opinion here. So, is this really going to transform the industry, or is this kind of a, just another exercise in compliance? The next set of standards that we need to follow here, and just you know, give it to us straight. Absolutely. So Mark and I have lived this dream for 40 years. <laughs> and, you know, think about it. We back in the day, oh, it was maybe comma separated value or various kinds of flat files that then went to HL7 V2. And then during the Obama administration and, and the Bush administration, to some extent, we said, oh, XML. XML will bring us everything we need. Well, what we discovered in the CCD and the CCDA, anyone can generate XML and absolutely no one can read it. Because <laughs> every single implementation is unique. Sometimes, and of course, this is Winston Churchill telling us there, Americans will eventually do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Well, we've now tried everything else, and it is JavaScript object notation over RESTful APIs, which is what drives every industry outside of healthcare. So by saying, oh, we're now at that stage with FIRE, we're actually years late to the game. It is, of course, the right technology. It is, will 
build a, such a seamless connection across the stakeholder in, environment, removing friction and impedance mismatch, if I can use that term. It is not hype. It is just technology. It's math. It's all good. And so, yes, this is something everyone should embrace. So it is a game changer. Without question, because, okay. you know, think about it for a moment. How does your app store on your phone, whatever it's Android or Apple work? Well, we've created standardized APIs for the ability to get an app and use an app. And well, in effect, think of this as enabling an app store kind of concept for healthcare across EHRs and other products. It is no question a way of building connectivity with less friction than ever before. So then what are the barriers? I mean, why are people jumping in and doing this? Um, Mark, so you're at a big plan. I mean, what's the problem here? What are the challenges? Well, and I think, as John said, you know, technologically, this is absolutely the right thing uh, and, and takes us a good direction. The, but it doesn't address directly some of the core challenges that we've all been wrestling with for decades of how do we ensure the individual's privacy of their data? Uh, Google Maps, great. I can open up the API. I can publish it. Anybody can sign in and try some things. Uh, it's a low bar. We can't afford that kind of openness, if you will, with healthcare data. And I think achieving, as Ruby talked about, the goals and vision of making sure that, that individuals do have access, that the folks they want to have access have access and so on absolutely enables that, but you know, I think we all are interested in protecting that information. And so the fact that we're dealing with protected health information is part of the reason that it doesn't go as quickly as some other industries, as John said, for example. The other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, I think that there are um, uh, other industries sometimes seems faster, but you know, like if you look at the banking industry, I think it was only seven years ago that paper checks quit being transferred between banks as the backup to the electronic transaction, decades after electronic, you know, so, so these things don't happen overnight, uh, for sure. Um, having said all of that, though, I think that the, uh, you know, the big barriers that folks face today is one is, is it's keeping up. Right there's a, we as John said we got CDAs kind of working and kind of you know and and they bring value don't you know there is absolute value to the CDA formatted data that's transferred uh, for example so but now we've got the next mousetrap but we've still got to keep up the CDA infrastructure and the HL7 version two infrastructure and the uh, and, and then the, as FHIR has moved from draft to normative standards, and now people maybe feel better about, yes, I can go after that, but the next version. So, so I think we, you know, this is a challenge for all standards of chasing the next version, doing it in a way that doesn't require a heavy lift to go to the next version and so on. And then lastly, I think the, you know, it's the network effect, right? And this is fundamental. If every provider and every payer had a fire endpoint available today, you could go do crazy wild stuff, right? Um, but you, you get into that trap of, well, golly, uh, only uh, you know, X percent of providers have a fire endpoint exposed today. And of those, only certain things are accessible or payers. Uh, for example, Anthem has been, I think, doing a great job of exposing uh, fire endpoints, but it's a journey, right? We exposed it first for certain subpopulations. I think the teams uh, this month has all populations now available through, when I say populations, I'm thinking about Medicaid members, Medicare members, commercial members, large plan, you know, there's all these subsets which have separate issues related to permissions and processes and so on. So. I, I think that the network externalities always are the tricky part to drive. And whether that's through regulation, you know, you must do this, or whether it's through the value proposition, absolutely going to do this because you, you have to, each organization has to find the value in, the, in that uh, connection and, and bi-directionally, right? Leveraging it or exposing it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
Keith and Viet, I see you having your own little conversation here in the sidebar, and I'm going <laughs> to um, shine a light on it here. Um, Viet Nguyen is the new Chief Standards Implementation Officer for HL7. Having a little trouble with his camera. Viet, can you hear me? I hear you. I think you're on mute. I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, Keith wanted to know um, yeah. what... Great, thanks. Keith Keith wants to know, and if you could share with everybody else, kind of what's the timeline for at least 80% of the industry or the majority of the industry getting on board with this? I mean, is this gonna be a slow walk or what? I think this is going to be a rapid advancement. Um, as I mentioned in the chat in uh, July, 2021, ONC released a report that 84% of hospitals and 61% of clinicians have adopted um, fire-enabled EHRs. A larger percentage of the inpatient EHRs are already fire enabled because the top five uh, vendors in terms of market share have those uh, features enabled. Outpatient, it's a little less because the number of EHRs is uh, more diverse. And so uh, the adoption rate is not quite as high. The lower adoption rate with clinicians in general though is, is really a function of not all clinicians have adopted EHRs and, and of those, how many uh, only practice in the outpatient setting and how many of those have fire enabled EHRs. But uh, we anticipate as um, a fire adoption uh, grows and the industry sees the value of it, both to patients, but also clinicians and uh, payers that the number of uh, uh, EHR vendors and certainly the number of payers will increase uh, the ones who support fire. Ruby, and the key yeah. date yeah. around. Sorry, oh. go ahead, Jet. But the key date for us, uh, in terms of really accelerating this and and uh, accelerating the network effect, is really this December of uh, this year, when the certified health IT vendors, uh, with part of certification, will enable uh, Fire uh, version 4.0.1, uh, US Core for standard Fire profiles, as well as Smart on Fire, and that will be. Um, uh, we we uh, call the skating to the puck. That will be the puck where everyone will uh, kind of coalesce and um, really be starting on this, that same page as we continue to mature fire, which is already, I would say, 85, 90% uh, complete uh, in terms of uh, general uh, patient care. Mm -hmm. We're really just maturing the other aspects of, of fire around uh, social determinants and, and uh, uh, administrative workflows uh, and research and public health as well. Yeah. R Ruby, you're out there with a number of different providers working. What are you seeing as some of the biggest challenges or what are you hearing about? Um, I, I think we have the providers that are trying to understand how their certified EMR vendor delivered the fire systems and how they can use that themselves. Um, versus just relying on the vendor because the smart providers are realizing that they want to take control of these fire endpoints and build new things out like a price estimator. So they want they want access to them. So they're trying to understand that. So that's that's their learning curve. They're they're grateful and and accelerated by having a vendor with a certified technology, but they still have to learn how to use that themselves because many haven't. And on the plan side, their challenge is mapping their claims databases and their data lakes and analytics capabilities, whether it's from a population health system or anything else, into FHIR. So the larger ones have been very successful at this, but the mid-sized plans are you know, struggling with the integration tools they need to map from a non-HL7 source into FHIR. Um, that said, though, foundationally, the patient access database or patient access fire API, which is mandated, you know, is very similar to the payer to payer data that's coming in the future that's been delayed. So once you get that and the provider directory kind of stood up, you already have a couple of good building blocks to begin with. So, um, and and as noted by Vit, there, you know, there. There's definitely, and by the audience, Gail um, kicked in uh, the CAQH posting, there's more and more capabilities and more and more published endpoints out there. And I would just end that the last bit is the publishing the endpoint is still a little bit of a challenge because 
this is transformative and we need to take a moment to pause about this transformation because healthcare has historically connected to HIPAA covered entities, meaning someone who is processing clinical data or administrative data for the purposes of either reimbursing or providing care. So now the, these standards are saying this has to be available to a non clinician, a non health plan, a non covered entity. And so it's a little bit of new thinking for us about how we're going to expose that endpoint. And again, as you know, I like to say we're moving from a project based world where every connection is a project into a world where you have an ability to go explore a set of endpoints, choose them, test them and go to production without a project manager. Yep. That's a good way to think about it. Mark. Mark. Yeah, just building on that, and I'd love the other panelists' thoughts. You know, the just on your point about the adoption and uh, is, you know, many, uh, I think the mental model in FIRE is often this very exactly as you outlined, Ruby, transactional, you know, this consumer looking for a provider or this consumer. And yet, what we see in practice, so for example, Anthem and, and, uh, stood up its provider lookup endpoint last July or so. And I don't know that we've had a single consumer-based app query that endpoint. And what we see is much more bulk use of that endpoint searching by, and, and I don't know if it's data scraping, it's you know sort of business to business type things. And a lot of the same issues when you look at things like uh, uh, immunization registries or lots of other things that you might think you'd like to have a fire endpoint for is that they're not trans, you know, single transaction at a time, this sort of bulk query need, and, and there are bulk query things, you may comment on this, you know, in the works, if you will, uh, but, but it seems like the, some of the vision that we would have these one-off really simple things, you know, isn't how practically people have been leveraging it, but rather in these bulk modes, and that creates its own set of challenges and problems. Because uh, the implementations, frankly, aren't well aligned with that kind of use, I don't think. Well, so let me add to Mark's comments. So maybe two areas to explore as we look at what is FHIR and what is the interoperability and information blocking rule requirements to use it. So as Viet has said, there is something called the USCDI, our common data set for exchange. It's a specified number of data elements. So, hey, I have a new use case, Mark. You know, I'm a cardiologist and I'm going to want to do diagnosis, treatment and care planning based on a fire endpoint. Oh, all the data a cardiologist needs is not in the US CDI. So what do we do? We create a fire accelerator like M card or for cancer M code or for administrative data Da Vinci or you know code X for clinical trials and these fire accelerators which are great that extend the fire R4 spec so that it will now handle many more use cases and many more variables so that's sort of once you know it's in process things are going but here's another issue it's workflow it's exactly what you have all said my mom is 80 years old and you know, I said, I was with her two days ago. I said, mom, you now have a fire endpoint where you can get your JavaScript object notation formatted longitudinal clinical data set to your phone. And of course she looks at me and says, I have not a clue what you said. And why would I want that? But how about this? I am thrilled to delegate to you the management of my healthcare. Okay, great. Anthem, you know, or Ruby, how does my mom delegate to me the stewardship of her healthcare data for me to manage? That's not a workflow that is very well described or universally available quite yet. But I would say that's one of the most wanted consumer apps because more and more of us have elderly parents. And I've yet to meet anyone in healthcare, including my sister who still works at Mayo, that doesn't get questions from every family member and person they meet on the street. What about this? What about that? So we all ask folks to look into our records to help us translate, to help us understand. This is something many families want. Um, and, you know, we're so close, not quite there, but we're very close. Viet, why don't you jump in here? <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I think the uh, con, um, patient consumer adoption is really where this will to, will take off. And by way of of uh, analogy, I think there are three major components, and I'm going to say awareness, opportunity, and value. So patients need to know that these tools are available to them. So I use the Apple Health Kit. I happen to use my um, uh, uh, hospital uh, EHR to get my data, and I find my hospital EHR data in my health kit. I was able to access my immunizations from the Utah State Registry using the health kit. So that's helpful. Number two is uh, pointing out opportunities for these technologies. When I went to get a refinancing, when the mortgage rates were low, my my mortgage uh, lender asked me, uh, we need your bank records. Would you like us to act, help you access that from your bank directly? And so they used uh, OAuth and OpenIDs, same things that, that uh, Fire and Smart did. And I was able to give them limited access to my financial records so I could get my mortgage done more quickly instead of copying it and putting in the PDF and sending it. So they need, we need to find those opportunities to let patients know that we have technologies to support them. And then thirdly, we have to provide them value, not just patients, but providers to support them with uh, prior authorization or provide them clinical data in referrals so that they can take care of patients. And when uh, the community, payers, providers, patients find that value, they're going to ask for more. And that goes to John's point. We have some limited um, high value use cases and workflows that we're addressing, but as individuals want more and more uh, opportunities to improve efficiency, they're going to ask for more workflows. And that's really the role of these accelerators uh, that I help to support in HL7 to bring those communities of stakeholders together to identify those workflows and then uh, identify opportunities to utilize FHIR and those FHIR data models to improve on those workflows and efficiency. We're going to go beyond just uh, terminology. We're going to go beyond APIs. And we're going to get to a point where we have some standardized workflow interoperability, and then we're really going to find that efficiency, much in the same way we see for travel, e-commerce, and banking. And so to that point, I mean, just to illustrate, and Jen, you know that I am an open book, right? My medical records are all public. My genome is public. So while Viet was talking, I downloaded an open source free app called Common Health to my Android phone and then told the Mayo Clinic to download my entire lifetime medical record to my Android phone through a Fire API endpoint, including all of my COVID data. And there you have my smart health card COVID vaccination information on my Android phone, all done in two minutes while he was answering your question. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> I used the same type of app when uh, with the state of Utah, after I got my immunization, I, I checked to see on my health kit whether or not my immunization records had reached there. And it had in less than 24 hours with no intervention from me as, uh, at all. It was a connection that Intermountain Healthcare had with the Utah State uh, um, Immunization Registry. And I saw the fire JSON. I'm nobody, I don't expect anyone to look at the JSON, but I could actually uh, look at the JSON and make sure that it was accurate and it was. So when, is this, yeah, when is this going to be really second nature? So what John just did, I mean, John is the Johnny Cash of Help IT. So um, when is this going to be second nature to everybody? You know, not if you work at Mayo or Anthem, but if you're in, you know, little tiny, um, you know, wherever <laughs> um, across the country. Well, well hey, let I me just say, uh, as I mentioned. Oh, please go ahead, Viet. Go ahead. Sorry, I, th I think we need to let folks know that these things are available to them, whether uh, it was on an Apple uh, platform or an Android platform. They need to know that it's available, and then they need to know that there are opportunities for them to use it. The immunization is a really great example of uh, we're often asked about, the, uh, especially those now traveling to conferences, to have immunization records. So they need to know that it's available, that there's a good opportunity to use them. And then just like you know, uh, the meal delivery or, or e-commerce or travel, they'll start to use those APIs and, and they'll grow accustomed to them. And I think that's how we're gonna grow um, the usage of, of uh, fire Gail, and just interoperability in general. Yeah, I mean, Gail Hamilton's asked a quick, great question here. Is there any metric on how many patients have used their smart on fire um, sharing mechanisms? 
Well, I'll give you an answer to that, right? So uh, I co-lead something called the Vaccine Credentialing Initiative. And with our, our friends in HL7 and Josh Mandel and others, we created this fire extension called the Smart Health Card. 270 million people are currently using that to display the vaccine credentials on their phones. Now, why? Well, because there's a value proposition, right? Uh, I mean, if you're a healthy person and you're 28, why do you want to download your completely normal CBC to your phone? What, what, what are you going to do with it? Whereas opposed to, oh, I want to go to a club tonight. Ah, well, you know, here's my QR code. I'm on that. <laughs> and I was just going to follow up on that. I think that, you know, consumer engagement in health, period, right, is a huge challenge, right? How much of us want to worry about our diabetes right now, right? It, you know, I don't want to do that. As John said, you know, I may want to find that great restaurant, et cetera. Uh, and, and so engaging consumers in their health is sort of the first hurdle. And this is really way down the road, right? Of the number of people, you know, John, of course, is going to be on top of every bit of data about his health in a timely fashion. My mom still goes to the bank teller, right? She doesn't even use the ATM. Uh, and there's some generational aspect to that, but I think there's just a, a personal style, engagement, energy level that, uh, so, I, you know, I don't, you know, I think it's debatable whether we will ever see the majority of consumers directly, uh, you know, even through apps and third parties leveraging these capabilities, because I don't know that we'll ever have the majority of people deeply engaged in their health on a regular basis. I'd like we to comment, to, but it's yeah, Ruby, go ahead, I'd like to in. comment on this because I think that this is where our regulators and even our local health departments and health systems are missing uh, opportunity mm. to educate consumers. All right, so I was a working mom and I had to get vaccination records every year to the school. Mm. I want this app. That mm -hmm. I, and this was a few years ago because I'm not that young, but I wanted this app like you would not believe because I had to take off work, drive to the doctor's office, get a form that was required by the school. So it wasn't just any form. It was a school form and then take it by hand to the school. We still have to submit vaccination records. And I'm not talking about mm -hmm. COVID. I'm just talking about sure. plain vaccination records. And there is, there are use cases for this. And I think the vast majority mm -hmm. of working parents in the United States would love to be able to get their um, physical for their kids in athletics and get it on an app and sent to the school. Like, like this is something we all need to John's point. This is a use case with value. It's value to many different people. It's just they don't know that it's even possible yet. And that's a great, great example, Ruby. And as a working mother, and I think a lot of them on the phone here right now would completely agree with you. So many of those kind of mundane tasks um, could really benefit from this. I, I, I believe so. It'd be, it'd be interesting if there's the time factor. But also, let's imagine there is some alignment of incentives as you look at value-based purchasing and new reimbursement models. You know, we all get safe driving discounts if we don't have an accident. What if you were more actively engaged in your health? Maybe you get a reduction in your copay. Maybe you get a free health club membership or something. So I suspect these next couple of years will create a more of an, and of course, for all of us who are the sandwich generation, managing those above, below, and our peers, there are incentives to do this. That'll help. Yes. And, and the, you know, I, yeah. I think it's worth pointing out that many health plans do have such incentives uh, for engaging in your health, whether it's getting, uh, you know, being actively engaged in going to the gym or whether it's uh, filling out health risk assessments or it's getting your colonoscopy done. There, there are incentives out there for many health plans, uh, whether it's Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, commercial plans. I think you'll, you'll find a lot of those. Maybe not, you know, here's $10 for using the app every month. Uh, although maybe we should think about that. Uh, 
<laughs> but um, so, you know, the the other thing I want to throw in the pile here, though, about sort of consumer demand uh, is, um, and and John, you were just giving this great example of you know went online, connected up, wait, you know, whether it's HealthKit or whether it's Android. Uh, you know, so Anthem has been, and Cheryl Tierney leads our team on this, and done a, done a phenomenal job over the last years in uh, in building out and exposing this infrastructure. But for example, neither of those two apps connects to Anthem, despite the fact that we have the ability to do that and have been after them for over a year to do it. And I got to think that the reason is, you know, if I'm the Apple team and I'm got the opportunity to connect to the largest, you know. I mean, you know, we cover a huge fraction of the U.S. population. It would make absolute sense. There just must not be a demand from their users for this. Otherwise, they would do it. So, I, you know, I think that's another proxy measure, if you will, for, you know, where who's asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great point. I, I, so I, I think we're, of course, we always say we're all patients. And so we're at the, the number of patients in this group are ones very engaged in, in technology. But they, along with patients, the providers and payers, especially within the DaVinci group, recognize the value of interoperability because our premise really has been this transition period we're in towards value-based care. And in value-based care, you need data. You need to know performance. You need to know, uh, you know the models for uh, uh, reimbursement in that relationship. And so we're um, trying to develop a value-based care journey mapping in the DaVinci group so that we can identify opportunities to improve on interoperability that already exist. The exchange of member attribution information, who is in that risk-based contract right now, or risk adjustments or quality measures are done very regularly, but through often proprietary tables. So our goal is to identify those opportunities that we can share a uniform risk adjustment or risk um, uh, an attribution list and then update it because that list then is used throughout the rest of the uh, value-based care contract. So the key here is that there, uh, in, uh, the consumers and access to individual data is really key, but there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained by sharing consistent standardized data and data formats between payers and providers for things like member attribution, performance metrics, risk adjustment, quality measures. And so our ability to really leverage those workflows that are existing today, but in proprietary formats, standardizing that formats will um, reduce the burdens. That's a big theme for us, reduce the burdens for uh, the providers and the payers in managing these value-based care contracts. But you could also imagine an ecosystem of new products and services that are going to be enabled by all of these fire endpoints. So let me give you a quick example. And, and Jen, I'm not advertising a product or service here, don't worry. But Mayo, over the course of the last two years, through this platform effort I lead, has developed 60 validated algorithms in cardiology, oncology, neurology, et cetera, with the notion that if you could ingest a fire uh, payload into an algorithm, the algorithm could then say, hey, Mark, you know, we've been watching your data and you really probably should get a colonoscopy because there is a 27% chance that you have a brewing lesion, right? And, and the question of course is if that brings value, right? Some people don't wanna know, <laughs> but others would say, oh, if I can have wellness and discover things early and avoid painful, invasive, expensive procedures, I would love to subscribe to a kind of monitoring service of that nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm going to bring yeah. up security and patient consent because we're going to, we've got 20 minutes left here and I want to make sure we address this before we get to this lightning round here. Okay, of course, you know, this is one of the biggest sticking points for people still. So um, concerns around patient consent and security. What do we do? How do we address these concerns? Viet, I'm going to let you start since you're <laughs> Technically, HL7. So in, in, yeah, so in, in FIRE, we have developed uh, uh, consent resources along with mm -hmm. provenance resources, and we've adopted uh, certain uh, uh, security uh, frameworks that are already kind of internet security uh, approaches like uh, OAuth and Mutual TLS and UDAP and all these other things. And so the key for us is that we identify these, we put them into our guides, and there has been some criticism about security and fire, but the criticism really was that when they were implemented, 
it wasn't the fire part of it. It was making sure that implementers use good security practices and making sure those practices are implemented because without those practices, we, we won't be able to get the confidence of the payers, providers, and, and patients in using fire. And I think we're going through something similar to what happened in finance you know, 10 years ago. People were, were unsure, un, uncomfortable with using financial apps, but as our, um, our trust in the security parameters that, that are used in finance, we started to use them more. And so um, we have methods of patient consent. I think general patient consent works pretty well. Granular consent is a little bit more challenging uh, because we have to parse unstructured data to remove um, clinical data that, that patients may not want to share. So I think that that is a, a challenge, but the ability to get, uh, get consent and, and document consent uh, is, is in fire. And Mark and yep. John can talk a little bit about how well the implementation of that is. <laughs> but there's a problem, and that is some of our leading EHR company executives have expressed concern and some have said, oh, well, they're just being anti-competitive or blocking or whatever. Well, I've actually chatted with all of them. Here's their concern. You know that as a payload goes to a patient's phone, it is then exiting the HIPAA cloud and all the regulatory protections. So imagine I'm playing, I'm gonna make this up, Mark, so just don't, don't laugh at me. You know, I'm playing Wordle and oh there's a pop-up that says you know are you willing to share your data and i just say yes and all of my data is now exfiltrated into god only knows where and so are people really going to understand their responsibilities once it is outside of a hipaa constraint yeah great point i think john illustrated the key problem problem is not consumers consumers have shown over and over again that they will take a trade off of security for whatever they deem as value. And many of them, as John illustrated, don't even value security very highly, it appears from their actions. I think it is our industry um, that is challenged and not just the vendors. I'm not gonna like blame the vendors because we have legal advisors in hospitals who will tell an emergency room physician not to trust a downloaded patient record because it hasn't been validated. And if they act on it and the data is wrong, they could be liable. So we have structural reasons why we like to rerun tests. It's not just all about greediness. It's about, I need to validate this because there's a life and death decision on it. And so all of the statements that Viet and John made are all about how the industry begins to build that trust so that the data elements are there. Uh, there's been a number of comments on quality of data. The quality of the data is there. And then it will not be the patient that says, no, I don't want this because it's not secure enough or no, I don't want this because the data is not good enough. It's us. We are the blockers to this because of our thinking. And that's why this is truly transformative because transformative things are cultural things. And so we are being challenged about our culture. And I'm not saying that our culture is wrong. I'm just saying that we have to think about what's the good in it that we wanna keep, which is certainly taking care of patients and doing the right thing and not making avoidable mistakes. But there's also how do we reduce the cost and the friction to get the data we need so we can treat people more rapidly and pay the right amount and ensure they get the right care, as Mark would agree. And there are some technical things we could do. And again, Jen, don't think of this as me suggesting a technology is magic. Okay. It's not. But uh, I did some work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Sub-Saharan Africa. And do you know there are some governments that are untrusted by people? Hard to imagine. And uh, so suppose a government entity is the steward of your health data and you can download that health data. Well, what we did, again, I'm gonna use the magic term blockchain. Please, again, don't think it solves all problems. But what we did is we hashed the fire payload and then put the hash in a blockchain and the consumer app could say, oh, does the hash of what I downloaded today match the hash of what's in the blockchain? Oh, it does. I can actually trust that it wasn't modified. So to Ruby's example, then if I shared that with a provider, there is actually a kind of non-repudiation that it hasn't been modified in the provenance from source to use. 
As always, John, I got to congratulate you for actually having a use of blockchain that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think John needs to put a dollar in the donation jar for having brought up blockchain, but that is a good example. And, and the, the other highlight that John points out is that the low and middle income countries are, are really um, accelerating their adoption uh, of FIRE. Uh, my uh, uh, the deputy chief standards implementation officer, Diego Kaminker out of Argentina, is working with folks from Central and South America who are eager to not only learn about fire, develop their health IT and interoperability capabilities. And they're, 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 they're really wanting this because they see it as a way of essentially leapfrogging over what the US has learned around V2 and, and uh, V3 and CDA and jumping straight to an API approach to uh, sharing of patient care data. So uh, I think the growth of fire internationally is going to accelerate even more over the next few years. Okay, so let's just assume we can do what John says and we validate it and we share it with everybody. What about the quality? We're getting a lot of questions about the quality. What if it's poor quality data that we end up sharing and uh, moving around? What, what then? I, I quality think quality comes in, in lots of different places. I mean, it comes in the, the capturing of the data when we have a conversation with our patients and actually <laughs> doing that. Um, that's a little more challenging. But when it comes to putting that data and maintaining quality where we have lab data, uh, imaging data, those type of things that once they're in the, the EHR, we can maintain their fidelity of that data as it uh, traverses. Uh, what John's describing in terms of using uh, fire payloads for clinical decision support, we want to use the same fire payloads when we do quality measure assessments so that we're not having individuals having to abstract data in order to report their quality measures. I, I remember clearly, John, I believe, has a diagram with 20 or 30 different organizations that, that hospitals are responsible for reporting some kind of quality measure or registry from. Now, if that were all in fire formats with you know, necessary profiles and extensions, we can lower that administrative burden on providers to report on quality and registry data and hopefully really get us further and closer, further along and closer to that learning health system we, we really want. Yeah. Ruby, jump in here. Yeah, I have to because this is one of my passion points. Mark said it first, so I gotta give Mark all the credit. So <laughs> the industry when fire started, and I remember attending sessions at HL7, you know, I don't wanna say 10 years ago, it was at least seven years ago on fire. And we were talking about using fire resources to only exchange parts of the CCD. Like what's the vaccination history? What's the medication history? What are the allergies? Things like that. What are demographic data? We were not talking about extracting an entire CCD, which for those who don't know, it's the entire history of the patient's interactions and, and care episodes and sending them somewhere. I would like to challenge us to get back to sending the key most needed things instead of defaulting to bulk exchange of data. The problem with the bulk exchange of data is very much the quality of it, the completeness of it, and how does it match to your own repository, which one's the most timely. But if we just start exchanging the fire resources and doing this as an API, fast and nimble and very focused use cases, I think that some of the questions about quality will become much easier to address because we're dealing with a smaller data set, we're dealing with smaller problem and things will get better. I hope that the industry does not begin to think that fire is just exchanging five years of health records with each other because it's way more than that. And I think to answer your question about data quality, I think it depends a little on the provenance of the data and its use. So I completely concur that there are a whole lot of companies now creating fire API based approaches to automagic reporting of quality. That is, if I'm gonna submit data to 20 different entities and I have to have data scientists pull it, it's a nightmare. But if it can just happen as a, neat, as a side effect of interoperability, good. As opposed to maybe if I have to rely on a fire payload to give a life or death medication, I actually have to use my clinical judgment and the fire data is just one data point. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I mean, as we over the next couple of years develop more provenance and more integrity tracking and that kind of thing, we'll get better reliance. But in the meantime, there are lots of great uses. 
Okay, a couple of quick questions here, guys. Is there a single registry of providers that have adopted FIRE APIs? Yes or no? Currently, no single registry, but there is uh, efforts uh, underway to create a national provider as well as payer directory uh, of uh, FIRE endpoints. So currently, uh, the way I find it is to look uh, for at the major EHRs who uh, have published uh, their uh, customers' uh, FIRE endpoints. And there, there are in the national provider registry the possibility to publish your FIRE endpoint. And, you know, something like six or seven percent of providers have done that to date. And it, you know, just in the spirit of the great thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. But, you know, I hope that we're at least thinking about that as the place where we'd like people to do it so that we're, uh, you know, we're not having 92 of them to choose from. <laughs> And um, also on here, so if you choose your EHR provider from a certified health IT product list, is it safe to say that they have met the interoperability requirement? Mm. Who's taking that? If it's well, self-certified, it follows the certifications. Uh, I think you, I wouldn't, I would check if, if that if it was something uh, a high value and uh, most of the, the providers would look to, uh, to check that too, but uh, at least for the major EHR vendors, they, they do support uh, the FHIR standard and, and, and the U.S. core FHIR profile. And what's going to be very exciting as we move beyond the U.S. CDI, this clinical, this core data set to a, what is called the EHI, oddly enough, Jen, you know, oh, elect electronic no information. <laughs> We're in theory going to have some certification criteria by the end of 2023 that say you're going to have to export the entire corpus of EHR data. So yeah, it's really important to get a certified electronic health record that has tested and validated capabilities for fire interoperability. Um, how about the lack of a patient identifier? Is that going to impact the adoption of fire-based apps? So I don't think it will have a major impact. And, and one of the major reasons I, I say that is that the approaches for privacy and, and authentication today really are tied to the individual. And so it's not like we're going in and, and querying for John Smith and hoping to find the right John Smith. It is really driven by an explicit permission by an explicit individual and that's tied to, you know, within a particular health system or a particular payer or whatever, a particular record. And so I, I don't think that that, I mean, there's other issues about identification and matching and so on, of course, but I don't know that it will have an impact on the adoption of fire. But of course, I'd love to hear the uh, uh, rest of the panel's thoughts on that. I think we have found all kinds of creative solutions to identity management. So my mom, when I was with her on Friday, said, hey, you know, do you know if my property tax bill is due? And you don't go to the website in California and type in her name, her birthday or whatever. No, what you do is a proxy for her, which is she happens to have a on her property tax bill, a number which is unique to her property that no one would know. And you type that in and, oh, you, you owe $2,000. And right, so I think there's a, we will find solutions to this, often using referential data that isn't necessarily publicly available demographic data. Yeah. Great, great response. I agree. I, I don't think the issue is patient-directed data sharing because we have the patient's approval for that. The issue is more the aggregation and the respect, the respect of the patient's decisions after the data has been aggregated. And the simple example of that is clinical trials. Many of you have probably seen the movie um, about the lady who's the source of some of the uh, genetic data that is being used for women's health. And how does that consent travel across data aggregations? And so in clinical data trials, you know, you can start to have a really good conversation to create a really big migraine for yourself. And especially if you're in Europe with the right to revoke consent. Here in the US, the, our challenges in the behavioral health space 
and not in the mainline clinical data exchange mm -hmm. or patient directed sharing world. And I believe that the more we erase cultural stigmas around that, the easier it will get to resolve that. Um, and, you know, it will come over time. Remember, just like the banking example, we're just starting this journey. And as we develop this trust and these skills, things will get easier. But right now, patient-directed sharing is very clear, both in a regulatory sense and also in an actual data extraction and exchange sense. Great. And now I'm going to, we've got just a couple minutes left. So I'm going to go around and ask everybody to share um, what is the one thing that you're hoping um, FIRE and APIs are going to allow you to do? <laughs> or your mother, John. <laughs> All right. So who wants to go first? So uh, I'll go first, I would. Okay, go. go ahead, Viet. Oh, thanks, John. So I, I would like to say that. Uh, I see a world where uh, a, a patient uh, or a care provider for a patient is able to manage and see their entire record and the interactions they have with pharmacies, with their specialists, with their hospitals, uh, and with their primary care providers, and that each of those providers can see what they need to see with respect to that record. In a sense, the, um, the travel platform, but for healthcare where uh, we can start to manage our health and know um, our, you know, our, the financial aspects of it as well as the clinical aspects of it and engage us in, in managing our own yeah. care. Great. Mark, what do you want to be able to do? There's so many things, but I, I think the thing that I, it, partly because of, as I say, I think, con well, consumer access is very exciting. I think, uh, you know, moving our vision down the road for just the healthcare ecosystem, mm -hmm. providers and, and public health and payers to be able to really leverage the data offers a lot of excitement to me with the consumer things to come, right? <laughs> so I'm, yeah. I'm really excited about the potential to scale with less pain uh, so that we can actually reach uh, the scale that's essential to make a difference in, in care across the country. Love it. Ruby, how about you? I always thought I'd let John go so I oh, can John. do the yeah. wrap. John? Go ahead, John? Okay. Well, so we've already heard from Viet, you know, what we want is care navigation, a ways for healthcare, or from our care coordination. One of the areas that I've spent a lot of time in recently is distributed clinical trials. How do we enroll more people and get them more engaged to ensure we have more representative participation in clinical trials, especially in rural settings? or in you know, the kind of critical access hospitals or non-academic sites. And I think the FIRE is really gonna enable clinical trials at larger scale. All right, great example. Ruby. Well, you know, my colleagues really set the vision. And so at Xway, we support open banking globally. And um, it's very interesting that open banking is much hotter overseas and internationally in Latin America and Europe than it is here, but it's here. And we saw examples of that that Pitt shared with his mortgage situation, right? Mm -hmm. So what I, my vision is open healthcare. And to get below that two word tagline, it's a composable ecosystem where these fire endpoints are available and people of all sorts, whether they're clinicians or um, health plans or third-party developers can choose these endpoints and create new and innovative solutions to solve the problems that we've been talking about today. Well, I just want to thank my incredibly wonderful panel. This has been so much fun. I knew it was going to be, and it was. You guys have delivered. Thank you. Ruby, fantastic. John, Mark, Viet, great to see you. And everybody, thanks for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon. See ya. Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys.